Welcome back to the pancake world, everybody. After a wonderful two-week vacation back to the United States to visit my family, sadly, I had to return to South Korea again. I've got eight months left here until I'm back permanently. Now that I'm back in South Korea, I can get back to making some videos and see if we can fight the Flat Earth together. Today we're going to take a look at time, the sun, and navigation. First, let's look at the history of time. In today's modern age, everyone has become accustomed to the base 10 metric system. But have you ever wondered why there are 24 hours in a day, and 60 minutes in an hour, and 60 seconds in a minute? Egypt is generally credited with being the first culture to divide the day into smaller parts around 1500 BCE. However, when they did this, they used a base 12 system. The exact reason for the ancient Egyptians' value of the base 12 system isn't known, but there are several theories. Some believe it was based on the 12 lunar cycles in a year, while others actually believe that it's based on the 12 joints in your fingers on one hand when you exclude the thumb. And with the joint method, you can actually count to 24 by using both hands. Early Egyptian sundials divided the day into 12 equal parts of sunlight, but these parts would vary in length based upon the time of year and the amount of sun you were receiving. Nighttime was similarly divided into 12 hours through various celestial objects. And once the concept of a 24-hour day was in place with the Egyptians, it just kind of stuck. The idea of fixed hour lengths didn't begin until the idea of heliocentrism began with the Greeks. Astronomers needed fixed time to document their observations at night. Around 140 BCE, Hipparchus proposed to fix the length of an hour into 24 equal parts day and night, as measured on the equinox. While astronomers began to use this method during the time of the Greeks, laypersons continued to adjust their hours to the daylight hours until the 14th century and the advent of the modern clock. When dividing the hours into subparts, Hipparchus and the Greeks used the Babylonian system of base 60, which they had inherited from the Sumerians around 2000 BCE. This base 60 system was also used for measuring angles and continued in map making and geographical coordinates. Around 200 BCE, Eratosthenes, the bane of the flat earth, used this system to divide the globe into 360 degrees, allowing for proper identification of one's location on a map. These degrees are today's lines of longitude, and measuring them is the point of today's video. How are these lines of longitude used to find your location on land? Easy, the sun, and time. At any given time on the globe, or even on an AE map, the sun is directly over some point on the ground. This is called local noon. And by knowing the track of the sun for your location, and being able to identify exactly when local noon is, you can identify your longitude. But how? Remember, the day was divided up into 24 equal parts. The sun travels 360 degrees around the globe, or across the plane, in that 24 hours. So this means that the sun will travel 15 degrees per hour relative to the crown. And this works on a globe and on the AE map. But to identify your point on the map, you need a fixed reference and an accurate knowledge of time. Today we utilize Greenwich, England as our fixed point. So that is what we will be using for this demonstration, and we'll even use it on the Flat Earth map. To begin, we will start with noon at Greenwich, which is zero degrees longitude. For every person standing on zero degrees longitude, this is the time of day when the sun reaches its highest climb into the sky. Again, local noon. Using a very accurate clock, if we allow one hour to pass, the sun will travel across the sky and will now be at 15 degrees west. At 15 degrees west, it is now local noon, and at Greenwich, it is 1 p.m. If we let five hours pass, the sun will be directly above 75 degrees west. This line of latitude is now at local noon, and Greenwich would be at 5 p.m. Knowing this information, we can identify where we are at on the globe or a plane. Here are the two keys to being able to identify the longitude for yourself. One, you need to be able to identify what time it is for you. 
This could be done through various methods, such as observing the sun's track through the sky. Galileo even proposed using the orbits of Jupiter's moons as a universal clock. See my video on Io and the speed of light here. And number two, you need to know exactly what time it is in Greenwich, England. If you were to measure your local time and determine it to be noon, and then look at your Greenwich clock and determine that at Greenwich it's 9 a.m., you would know that you are 45 degrees east of Greenwich because of the sun travel time. The exact location even continues with the clock analogy with minutes and seconds. The Statue of Liberty is located at 72 degrees, 2 hours, 44.33 seconds west of Greenwich, England. This principle is the same on a globe or on an AE map. But here's where we run into some problems, and they're pretty big ones. On a globe, these lines run between the North and South Pole. Near the pole, these lines get closer and closer until they actually intersect at the pole. At the equator, they are the farthest apart, before narrowing down again and converging at the opposite pole. But on the AE map, the most widely accepted view of the flat Earth, these lines of longitude don't reconverge at the South Pole. They just continue to go on forever as they pass the equator and get wider and wider. And here's what the math says about the AE map. Viewing the AE map in 15 degree segments, because this is the one hour travel time of the sun, the distances between zero longitude and 15 west are at 70 degrees north, 577 kilometers. 50 degrees north, 1,155 kilometers. 30 degrees north, 1,733 kilometers. And at the equator, 0, 2,599 kilometers. These measurements were based off of a 15 degree triangle and are indisputable. Measuring the distances from the North Pole to each of these lines of latitude are what gave me these distances between 0 and 15, the open end of the triangle. Now, these measurements alone cause a problem. Because using spherical geometry, the same distance at the equator is actually 1,642 kilometers. We've gained almost 1,000 kilometers of land between 0 and 15 at the equator. I'm not going to go into it right now, because I personally don't fully understand the differences and the intricacies of flat and spherical geometry, but here's a great video that Wolfie6020 did explaining this problem. Now remember, we've just gained a thousand kilometers of land distance. Distance that by all accounts for humans that actually live on the equator doesn't exist. Our problem gets even worse as we go past the equator. The AE map forces this 15 degrees to continue to grow almost exponentially. This is what these distances look like. At 30 degrees, we have a 2,000 kilometer gain. At 50 degrees, we have a 3,000 kilometer gain. And at 70 degrees, we have over 4,000 kilometer gain. Much of this land is out to sea or in the fictitious land of Antarctica. How does this actually look in reality? Let's take a look at Australia, the upside down country that others will still claim doesn't exist. And for this project, we're going to take a look at Sydney and Adelaide. On a globe, the direct line distance between Sydney and Adelaide is about 1157 kilometers. This is at the 34 degree longitude line. This places the straight line distance between Sydney and Adelaide on the AE map at over 3000 kilometers, a gain of more than 1900 kilometers, a gain that no person has ever documented on the ground. And this isn't a no man's land, it's not like it's out to sea that has no roads. There are modern paved highways between Sydney and Adelaide, and to date, no Australians have complained that they ran out of gas driving between these two locations because the road was actually longer than the maps claimed them to be. But what about flights? Let's take a look to see if there's any flights between Sydney and Adelaide.
And wouldn't you know it, there are. At least once every day or two. And these are real flights, with real people that get on a plane at one city, and get off a plane at the other city. And the travel time between these two cities is about an hour and a half. For this flight to fit into the flat Earth world, that plane would need to be traveling at an average speed of 1,924 kilometers per hour. That's not max speed. That's average speed, take off to touchdown. Max speed would be about 200 kilometers an hour faster. Now, flat earth gods like Jaren will claim that we don't really know how fast planes can fly. Stay tuned till next week. But until he can show me a commercial jet that has a max speed of over 2,000 kilometers an hour, a speed approaching Mach 2, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. And he knows it. As for the rest of the Flat Earth community, show me where my math is wrong. Show me where the Southern Hemisphere isn't almost triple the size that it's claimed to be. Show me that these distances are actually real. Show me that people are wrong on how far they're driving. Show me that boats go a lot faster than they do, or they take a lot longer to get across the Southern Hemisphere oceans. My math is in the attachment below. I'll admit it's probably not exact because most of this isn't real. It's back of the napkin type of math. But according to all accounts of how the flat earth should look, the southern hemisphere is drastically different than reality. So I challenge you, prove me wrong. Thanks for joining me again, everybody. It's good to be back online. It's good to be back chatting with everyone. Until next week, stay flat.